I would say that the hottest topic for MASC of 2013 was immunotherapies, at least in lung cancer, but in, in several other cancers. There are a lot of presentations about immunotherapies, but I didn't select any as a clear highlight. What is your takeaway of, of the presentations that you've seen of immunotherapy, first in lung cancer, but then maybe anything else you're following peripherally? Has the field moved forward in this, or where are we now compared with highlights from 2013? The sessions that I uh, attended where immunotherapy was discussed, in particular in lung, we have one more year of experience and one more year of confidence uh, managing the minimal side effects um, of, with these drugs. I think there is a recognition that patients with PD-L1 uh, express, expression on the outside of their tumors um, have a better likelihood of responding. And um, Naya Rizvi yesterday presented uh, uh, data suggesting an, an objective response rate, I think, in the in the 20s, which is commensurate with the other studies last year. I think the, the other compounds were a little further along in lung a year ago, and this year, um, MK3475 uh, Pembro, uh, Pembrolizumab, um, I think, caught up mm -hmm. in terms of data report. Um, and so I think we have, we still have a race going on. I, I don't know that we learned any more about whether one is better. I think uh, slowly these drugs are finding their way into the first line uh, setting. And, um, and so what uh, the landscape looks like for 2015, I think, is, is interesting because we will have a number of patients who've been treated with uh, immunotherapies in the first line, and so uh, how that will impact second-line therapy is interesting. I, I was looking at this year's ASCO to understand the discordance that we have heard about between um, different uh, uh, diagnostic assays measuring PDL1 expression. Um, I, I looked at some great posters, but I don't I don't know that uh, I don't know that we understand that yet. But um, but that I understand as a as an example of individual tumor variability that impacts um, response rates. So um, I, I think we have a growing experience. We have a growing confidence, um, but. Uh, I, and, uh, and I think the landscape is shifting uh, slowly. Yeah, sir, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, uh, I, uh, I think this is a, an unbelievably exciting area of oncology. It's the single most encouraging thing we've seen in years. And, you know, I didn't grow up when cisplatin was first discovered, but cisplatin revolutionized cancer care. It's the part of backbone treatment of 17 different cancers, and it cures cancer, both in the metastatic setting and in the adjuvant setting. We should clarify some cancers. Yeah, some about. cancers. Yeah, of course, it, it, you know, the platinum agents can cure testicular cancer, and they're, they play a prominent role in some other diseases. It can right. be a second line treatment of lymphomas and things like that. Um, but, um, but it is the backbone, and it can cure patients in the adjuvant setting, uh, particularly in lung cancer. Um, and I think we thought, at least I thought, angiogenesis was going to be the platinum of our generation, that it was going to be used in all sorts of different cancers, and it was going to cure people in the adjuvant setting, and it was going to be used in every cancer, and that it was going to have a big impact, and, and it, it was a little bit def deflating. And I think that uh, we do have to be careful because I don't want to repeat that sort of story where we think it's going to do the same thing. Immunotherapy is going to be the end-all, be-all for all diseases. It's going to cure people in the adjuvant setting, and it's going to you know, prolong survival in a dozen different diseases. And, and then you study it more, and you lose a little bit of enthusiasm the more that you learn. Having said that, my enthusiasm is really high. And uh, not only do patients with a broad, you know, your, it doesn't, your cancer at least, it doesn't seem to matter. Although there was a little bit of data correlating immunotherapy with, with genotype, but it doesn't necessarily seem to matter why your cancer became cancer. We may find that not to be totally true, but superficially that is sort of the initial <laughs> signal, squamous cell, adeno, melanoma, renal cell, you know, all sorts of cancers that seem to, uh, to have a similar mechanism to resist the immune kill 
of them. And what we see is not only are a broad spectrum of patients with lung cancer who have advanced disease, received multiple prior therapies, not only are they responding, but there's a subset of patients who respond for a really long time. 20% of patients who respond, now that's a subset of a subset, 20% of patients who respond respond for more than two years. That's substantial. And uh, I am optimistic that this is going to have broad use in many cancers. I'm optimistic that many people with different cancers are going to live longer because of this class of drugs. And I'm hopeful that more people can be cured of cancer, probably those with early stage disease, but you never know. There is, there is a precedent. A small set of patients with metastatic renal cancer are cured with immunotherapy. Um, and that's a different disease. But I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, I think as an oncologist, our glass tends to be half full. And uh, we need stuff like this to keep ourselves excited. And this is it for me. Well, I, I view it like another subset that we are making huge strides in along the lines of EGFR, ALK, and other things where when we find a target for the right people or we find the right targeted therapy, you can have great effects. You'd mentioned 20% you know, of responders. Unfortunately, our responders are not 80% of our patients at this point. It's a minority, but in a minority of patients, you can have a profoundly gratifying effect for them, very prolonged. It's wonderful. We don't even know how long that might go. Could be five years. Could be. Could be could longer. Be. Could be forever. But, Who knows? But unfortunately, it's not everybody. And we, we're just, you know, at this point, we're tackling group by group. And I think one of the most important things will be identifying as best we can which patients are going to be the biggest beneficiaries so that we can direct them toward that therapy over chemotherapy or some other route. So... I'm, I think there's great reason to be hopeful. Not as clear, you know, a lot of debate about whether PD-L1 expression is really the holy grail there or still too murky in terms of the different methods and cutoff points to really call that uh, the key selection point. I don't know if you have any thoughts on PD-L1 expression. Well, it's, it's, it's a challenge with a lot of these assays, and so that's, that's part of the challenge. Um, but, you know, I think for patients and families that might view this, we don't want to set unrealistic expectations. Um, cancer is, a, is, is an awful difficult disease to treat and certainly difficult to cure. But uh, I think that uh, there's really never been another time where our understanding of cancer has evolved as quickly as it is now on so many different fronts. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think we're hopefully close to a tipping point. And um, I'm hopeful. I think we've got a lot far, when I was a fellow 15 years ago, I can't even tell you the, the, the very, uh, the, the, the things that we were debating. We were debating, should you use a carbo AUC of five or six? What's the best dose and schedule of five FU? Uh, and, and now we're debating, you know, is it Exxon 19 or Exxon 21? It's, it's a different time. Yeah, and certainly the, inc the increment of gains we're making is tremendous.